Hello, everyone. My name is Annie Henninger, and I'm the Access and Education Program Manager here at the Aspen Art Museum. It's great to see so many familiar faces in the audience. Um, I am thrilled to welcome you the, to this evening's talk with Mrs. Emily Rails. Mrs. Rails, along with her husband, Mitchell Rails, is the founder, and she is also the director, of the Glenstone Museum in Potomac, Maryland, an accessible institution that mindfully ties an extensive collection dedicated to modern and contemporary art with architecture and nature. Words such as unhurried and uncrowded have been used to describe the visitor experience at Glenstone. It's also my pleasure to introduce Max Weintraub, um, who is the Aspen Art Museum senior curator, who prior to joining the Aspen Art Museum team last January, served as the director and chief curator at Indiana University's Heron School of Art and Design. And Max will be facilitating a conversation or discussion with Mrs. Rails after her talk. Um, these art talks provide the opportunity to consider the power of art together and they are made possible by the generosity of the Questrom Education Fund. So thank you for being here tonight, and thank you so much, Mrs. Rails, for being with us. Thank you, thank you Annie. Can you hear me? This is, okay. It's just not very, it doesn't seem amplified to me, but I guess it is. Um, so I'm very happy to be here today. It's, it is, there we go. Okay, thank you. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. I've never been to Aspen, and um, the beauty of this place is frankly shocking to me. Even though I am um, born and raised in Vancouver, where we have our share of big, tall mountains too. So <laughs> this do actually does remind me of, of home. Um, but I'm really pleased to be here to talk about Art Matters. Uh, I believe that's the, the name of this lecture series, and the question is, why is art crucial to contemporary life? So I'm assuming that you are all here because you all believe that art is already <laughs> crucial to contemporary life, but let's just say, let's just say for a minute that you're not convinced. I'm gonna do my darndest to try to convince you that Art is, in fact, important and central to who we are as people. And um, I'll talk a little bit about Glenstone Museum and what we've been doing there um, recently. So Glenstone, for all of you um, who haven't been or haven't heard of us, we're a museum in Potomac, Maryland, which is 15 miles away from the center of Washington, D.C. We're very much a part of the Washington area uh, ecosystem of museums. Um, we work very closely with the National Gallery of Art, the Smithsonian. Um, there are many, many museums in our area. So uh, one of the questions was, well, how is Glenstone different? Why would Washington need another museum? And the answer to that is that Glenstone is more than a museum. It's an experience that fuses art, architecture, and landscape into a kind of totality. So um, what you see here on the screen is the culmination of um, about seven years of work, which uh, we just opened to the public last October. This is our new museum building that is called the Pavilions. It was designed by Tom Pfeiffer out of New York. We're very proud of this gorgeous building. It is looks like a cluster of buildings from the outside, but it's actually one, um, one building that is linked by a common passageway, and I can show you how that works um, in the subsequent slides. Um, so we've been open for a little over 12 months, um, and I'm really pleased to say that we welcome just shy of 100,000 visitors. This is um, up from about 5,000 before we, <laughs> before we uh, opened the new building. Okay, let's see here. So uh, when I was invited to give this talk, immediately I was struck by how it resonated with our number one core value which is that art is essential to life. Now, if we assume that um, I'm not preaching to the converted already, 
um, you might ask me, well, life? Why is it important to life? It's not oxygen, it's not water, it's not the air, you know, it's not food. Well, I like to say that um, art is important because it is a shared language that can connect us to uh, people that may not share the same views as us, that may, they may hold different ideologies dear to them. Um, art transcends these borders and that's what makes it so powerful. Um, and thinking through why art's important to me, I remembered my time as an undergraduate student when I decided that I wanted to study art history. And um, my professor told me, well, you know, art history is more history than it is art. I was a little baffled by this comment. Um, I said, well, what do you mean by that? You know, we're, I'm in this darkened auditorium going through these slideshows and all we see is art object after art object. And she explained to me that it is the history, it's the stories that these artworks tell that makes art so important. That art is, artworks are repositories of meaning and it allows us to understand our past and therefore acknowledge who we are in the present. So that, that historical element is really important. It's important to us because we are a collecting institution. We um, collect works from World War II to the present, and I'll show you some examples of that shortly. Um, second, I, I think about art as uh, an essential part of a just and humane society um, for the same reasons that I listed earlier, that it's a way to communicate with others. Um, and my friend Darren Walker, the president of the Ford Foundation, um, has said that uh, the arts can move us toward empathy or action, um, ideally both. And then finally, um, something that we try to really express at Glenstone is that art gives you license to dream. I mean, think about all these artists who are doing these really wild and crazy things, immersive installations, um, it, that's a very powerful message to a young person who is creative and who thinks, oh, I couldn't possibly transform my creativity into something tangible, but actually you, uh, these kids can and we want to inspire them to pursue a life in the arts. This is Glen Stone, and um, let me see if this, yeah. So it sits on 300 acres. Um, it includes, can you see the, the red laser pointer here? So th this is the sort of the, the outer border of it. As you can see, a lot of it is in forest. Um, so, Glenstone is as much an outdoor experience as it is an indoor experience. One of the things that we work so hard on with the expansion is the um, thought and sort of careful choreography of the approach. Because I'm convinced that people can't have a meaningful encounter unless they're primed for the aesthetic experience. So what we did was we looked at, sorry, this is not, I'm just gonna use my f hand. <laughs> um, we looked at this whole property and we didn't wanna place this new museum by the road. Why? Because we felt that we needed um, to give the visitor time to decompress. So the parking area is deliberately located here, away from the museum. The entry is, the entry is right here, so you pull off the road, and as you drive onto the, the pathway, imagine being in your car, and you can hear the crunch of the gravel underneath your tires. It's like going into a national park, very different from the asphalt that you were experiencing just moments before. And as you make your way down here, you are, um, you notice the signs, and these are the three parking groves. These are not parking lots. These are groves because you park next to a tree. And that was a very important thing that we borrowed from Acadia National Park. 
um, and other national parks that um, we frequented. From there, visitors come to the arrival hall right over there, and that's where they check in. So at Glenstone, you make a reservation, and then you come and you take your reservation, and, uh, and you sort of make your way through the experience. Um, this is a tough thing for some people to understand. Well, why, why are you limiting attendance by asking people to book a reservation? Because it preserves the experience, because it's never going to be crowded, and it's never going to be, um, you know, uh, hurried, and I think crowds and, and being feeling hurried are, are very much linked. So then, after you check in at the arrival hall, you make this walk to the pavilions. That's about a five to seven minute walk. And during that time, you avail yourself to the beautiful scenery, the meadows that surround the, uh, the pavilions. You see a artwork off in the distance. That's Jeff Koons' Split Rocker. It's, uh, it's um, planted with 20,000 flowers every spring, and it's a mosaic culture, so it, uh, the flowers come together almost like a pointillist painting, and um, you see uh, the head of a pony and the head of a um, dinosaur fused together. It's a really remarkable thing, and one of our most um, popular artworks. So between the time that you drive on to the gravel paved uh, entry road and when you enter the pavilions, it's about a 20 minute period of decompression. And we find that that's when we can get to the real business of talking about why art is so important. As you walk into the building, you notice that it's all completely naturally lit. Not a single electric light is on. Um, the light is very carefully calibrated to sort of draw you into the experience. And one of the first things that visitors see after they walk down a set of stairs is a view onto the water court. So this is a water garden that is in the heart of the building. Um, it's planted with uh, um, irises and various different rushes, and they um, change throughout the year. Um, but I spoke earlier about this kind of um, trinity of art, architecture, and landscape. And this is a moment that sort of brings that home because here you are in an art museum, you've seen a little bit of art, not much, um, and you're constantly aware of nature and the landscape that surrounds you um, and aware of these very beautiful concrete forms that make up the building. Also, we can talk a little bit about the thematics of light. Um, light has always been um, a strategy in places of worship, in temples, and churches, and uh, I would say that museums are today's versions of temples. It's a temple to art. And as you make your way along the passage um, with the view of the water court on one side, you start to see sculptures that come into view. This is a work by Martin Purrier. It's called Big, Big Phrygian, and it was one of the works that traveled to Venice last year for the Venice Biennale. We're very proud of Martin, who has become a dear friend. Um, I call this a signature integration moment, because here you have, whoops, sorry. Here you have um, a work of art, you have the architecture, and you have the landscape, and it all comes together um, to uh, create a seamless experience. So, moving on from there, um, we've, we've now sort of caught your attention, right, with, um, with these beautiful spaces, and now we um, are able to tell the history of art through, through our eyes. Um, and so, I said earlier that, that art 
and artworks are repositories of meaning. They narrate our history. Um, one of the most important things that we do is we talk about the canon of art history and how art has changed um, in the 20th and 21st centuries. And I could think of no uh, more impactful and iconic work than these works by Marcel Duchamp. Um, the fountain is arguably the, the, and that's the urinal on the, on the pedestal. Um, that really changed the way we all thought about art. If now a urinal can be considered a sculpture, then really anything goes. Um, you know, this is kind of self-evident to a lot of people who are very familiar to contemporary art, but I, I can't, I'm surprised that I still have these conversations with visitors in the galleries, like, well, how is this art? You know, and, and these are conversations that happen on a day-to-day -day basis, and I think it's, it's, um, it's an important thing to continue to practice because it's not that obvious why this is such a game changer, but it is. Um, so then there are these types of works. So this is a work called Home Sweet Home 2. It's from 1960, and it's by the uh, French-American artist Armand. And um, as you can see, it is composed of many, many gas masks that are uh, brought together into, in a vitrine. So he thought of these as paintings, but he called them accumulations. Um, this is a work that speaks to the horrors of war, of course. He was uh, a child of war, and he wanted to talk about his own experience and also the experience of his generation that uh, endured hardship and, and loss during the Second World War. And, and it's works like this that remind us that the 20th century was a very turbulent, very bloody time. Um, and I think it's a really important kind of symbol uh, and um, teaching opportunity to younger generations who haven't really uh, experienced this kind of hardship. A work like this is not so obvious that it narrates history, but that it narrates a different kind of history. And to me, this is uh, a very, um, poignant story because it's, these are sculptures by Ruth Asawa. Ruth Asawa was born in California in the 20s, uh, the daughter of Japanese immigrants to this country. Um, her parents uh, were seasonal crop farmers and uh, she was one of, I think it was like seven or eight children. Um, in the 40s, she and her family lived in Japanese internment camps. Um, so for many years, she uh, was um, being educated in these camps and graduated from high school, still in one of the camps. And after she was released, she decided to pursue her love of art. Uh, these days, I find it really amazing that a young woman, a young Japanese American woman would have the courage to go and pursue something that is so obviously unimportant <laughs> and non-functional. Um, but she speaks about the experience as having really convinced her to pursue her passion. Because, you know, you can't take anything for granted is, is kind of the, the message. Um, she went to the experimental school, um, Black Mountain College in North Carolina and was um, there with Merce Cunningham and Joseph Albers and a, kind of the most avant-garde thinkers of, of the time. She met her husband there and ended up settling in San Francisco. And in the 50s, she had six children in nine years. But she didn't stop making art. And th this is the important thing, is this is when biography is really, really important to, um, to recount to an audience, right? Because she didn't give up on her art. In fact, she wove it into her, her life. Um, she started making these looped biomorphic wire sculptures in her home while she was raising her children. And I, I uh, found this quote that I wanna share with you um, from her daughter, Aiko Kuneo, 
And she says, we always saw her making art. It was part of her everyday existence. I never thought of her making art as a separate activity. To us, she wasn't working. We didn't have to be quiet so she could concentrate. Her art making space was always in our house. And there are these really extraordinary uh, photographs by Imogene Cunningham from the 50s where you see her working away and there's toddlers, you know, and babies crawling around on the floor and, she, and it's all interwoven. Um, what an amazing way to express that art is essential to life. For her, it really was her lifeblood. So, um, moving on and still on the subject of history, which is that, yes, art narrates history, but museums also have a very powerful role in shaping that history. Uh, one of the things that I find to be the most um, challenging is to create exhibitions that um, can open people's eyes to a different way of looking at history. Um, one of the things that a lot of museums are looking at carefully right now is inclusion and making sure that the art that's on the walls reflects a diverse population, who we are as Americans, right? Um, so with the new um, opening of the uh, Museum of Modern Art, for those of you I'm sure who've read about it, um, there was a lot of effort putting, put into making sure that there were many um, artists' works that are, uh, are um, people of color um, and um, sort of people who kind of represent a whole spectrum of cultures and backgrounds. We did a similar thing at Glenstone. So here you see on the left is a work by Jasper Johns. It's called Flag on Orange Field 2 from 1958. Jasper Johns is 89 years old. Um, and Jasper Johns is a household name. Jasper Johns uh, enjoyed celebrity from an early age because he was um, in New York and was in the right place at the right time and, uh, and enjoyed that acclaim. Um, on the right is an artist named Faith Ringgold. She is 89 years old. Uh, she started making paintings when she was a child. Um, but she's a black woman and she uh, was very devoted to her art. She was able to make a living as an art teacher. So, so that's how she kind of came into the art world. It wasn't easy for her to stick to her practice because um, nobody wanted to show her work. Uh, today she's having a sort of uh, rebirth and people are starting to notice her um, extraordinary contributions. And notably at MoMA, Picasso's Demoiselle d'Avignon hangs in the same room as one of her um, most spectacular paintings called Die. Um, but here at our opening, this is a year ago, uh, I really felt it was important to show her work, which is also of the American flag, um, from 1969. It's called Flag for the Moon. And if you look closely, the stripes are actually um, letters. And they spell out a word that um, she felt was reflective of how people viewed black people at that time. So why is this the flag for the moon? It was 1969, and if you remember, that's when the Apollo moon landing happened. And she was very much um, an activist at the time. She uh, was bemoaning the, um, the state of affairs in her own backyard in Harlem, and she, she said, you know, if, they can, if the American government can send people to the moon, why can't they feed the starving kids in my neighborhood? So, um, so she created this flag because, you know, freedom, this flag represents freedom for all of us, but for her, it was a botched um, plan. And, um, and she felt it was important to use this symbol to get her message across. 
another artist that we're featuring right now at Glenstone is Carrie James Marshall. Um, he's an extraordinary painter. Um, this painting in particular has had an enormous um, response from our viewers. Um, it's called Untitled Underpainting. It's just a recent work. Um, Carrie James Marshall has made it his, uh, uh, an important part of his practice is to um, evaluate the position of African Americans as they've been de depicted in Western art. Um, in particular, he's looking at the exclusion of black bodies and in art, and so many of his paintings deal with this subject. Um, what you see here is a, a mirror image, um, and it looks like they're in a museum. Maybe it's the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Um, these paintings are hung salon style, and you see um, African American instructors, teachers, children uh, looking and listening and learning about art history, a history that they've been systematically excluded from. And here you see them on the floor, listening intently. And what's remarkable, remarkable about this is that um, it's, it's kind of a discursive thing where we're now looking at a painting of black children who are learning about art history and therefore, this painting is rectifying the situation <laughs> that Carrie James Marshall found so, um, um, so urgent to correct. I said earlier that art gives us the license to dream. And I think more than any other work at Glenstone, this is the one that um, really stays with people and um, appeals to that urge to dream, that desire to dream. So, so this is a work by Robert Gober. It's um, a multi-sensorial installation that includes sinks with uh, running water. It also includes a 360 degree hand-painted mural that depicts um, a forest. There's also discrete sculptures that are made to look like, but are not actually, uh, prison bars, boxes of rat bait, and newspaper stacks. Um, there's also theatrical lighting. So as you first enter the space, you enter into a darkened hallway, and all you can kind of um, sense is that there's rushing water, and it draws you into the inner, uh, inner chamber. It's a very powerful installation. It is at once pastoral and claustrophobic because it's, it is beautiful, but it's, not a, it's, it's, art, it's completely artificial. So visitors who are in there have um, remarked that they either could stay there all day and spend the night, and others say, I need to get out of here right now. <laughs> so it, it is kind of like a nightmare in a way. Um, and it's, it's super powerful. So it's great to see kids in there saying, you mean this whole thing was by one artist? And they, they had you bring in a, a team of eight painters who painted this mural over the course of three months. And you actually brought running water into the space. I mean, it blows people's minds. And so your mind is blown. And you wonder, what is this about? The clues are in the newspapers. So these newspapers are not actual newspapers. They're, they're facsimiles of newspapers, New York newspapers. So there's the, the Post and the New York Times and all the, the typical ones that we know. Um, the headlines, though, give you a clue into what the artist was thinking and what her, his concerns were. So this is from 1992. There are lots of headlines about the political events um, at that time. Um, the elder Bush was um, president at the time. Um, and then there's also kind of more sinister uh, kind of clues as to this, um, as to how it felt to live in New York during that time. So the backstory is that um, Bob Gober is a gay man, and he lived in New York through the 80s. 
Um, and he calls it the health crisis that was claiming the lives of uh, almost everyone he knew in downtown New York. So when the AIDS crisis first emerged, it wasn't known what the cause was. And uh, he and many of his friends and his community lived in perpetual fear because they didn't know how to protect themselves. He speaks about this installation as a kind of rebirth because at the time when um, people were dying around him, he said that a lot of men didn't know how to keep themselves safe. So that's when he started making sinks without plumbing, sinks that were uh, just kind of installed on the wall. And he said, well, you know, what do you do when you're at a sink? Well, you wash yourself. But here were these sinks that were stripped of their utility. And that kind of captured that feeling of dread that he and his community felt. Here, though, in 1992, it's sort of this return to life. And, um, and it's, but, but still with echoes of the past. This is um, a paste up of one of the um, newspaper sheets. And it shows that he manipulated the headlines. So some of these stories were, um, were actual stories that he took from newspapers. Others he invented, but it's impossible to know what's real and what's fake, kind of like today's news. Um, so you'll see at the top, it says, the Vatican condones discrimination against homosexuals. I don't know if that was something that was actually in the newspaper or not. Um, but at the bottom, you see a, um, an ad for Saks Fifth Avenue bridal wear, and that is the artist himself dressed in drag in a wedding gown that was custom made for him. So, um, I, I wanted to show this to you because it really illustrates that the personal is political. Um, it uh, was not, uh, you know, you think about today when gay marriage is, is uh, accepted in, in many places, is legal. Back then it wasn't. So this is a, a, a powerful um, memory of past events. And, and so, you know, when we talk about the power of art and um, how those of us in the art world really believe very fervently that art can change the way we look at the world. Um, but how do we really know? Well, I think there are testimonials that come back to us um, at the museum and I really hold on to those dearly. So we have um, some staff that works at the museum as, as interpreters, they're, they're guides, and much like here. Um, and the young woman who has spent the most time in this room speaking to visitors, her name is Laika, and she pulled me aside one day and she said, I wanna thank you for giving me this opportunity to work here um, because I identify as LGBTQ and, um, and this, allows me to speak about who I am to, to others. And so that was a very powerful moment. And looking back at um, the Carrie James Marshall, there was a group of middle school teachers who came recently, actually over the summer, um, they were doing a retreat at Glenstone. And they too thanked me because they now had something to, um, to go take back to their schools and they wanted to bring their students to see uh, paintings by Carrie James Marshall that depicted them. And to see yourself reflected in a work of art is extremely powerful. So um, I just wanted to end with uh, this quote by Peter Sheldahl. He wrote um, a review of the, the new MoMA recently, and, um, and you can see here, he said, not despite but because the focus is only art, it supplements serious thought about the world with registrations of what it's like to live in it. The out there of news squared up to the in here of spirit. And it's that squaring up that is so powerful and that I'm committed to uh, giving to our visitors. 
at Glenstone. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emily. It's, uh, it's, it's wonderful to hear how personal that story is. Um, and it's also amazing how quickly, I mean, I, I can't think of too many museums that have sort of stamped themselves on the American psyche the way that Glenstone has in a pretty short time. Um, and so I'm wondering, could you sort of go back, and I know that you and your husband were um, quite philanthropic in, in giving to other arts institutions prior to the founding of Glenstone. Could you just talk a little bit maybe about that transition from that form or other forms of philo philanthropy to um, founding a, a private museum? Sure. Um, so our philanthropy um, is focused on the arts and education. Um, that aspect ha actually hasn't slowed down much. We're, we're still supporting um, uh, schools in the inner city and charter schools um, as one arm of our philanthropic work. Uh, but Glenstone, as you rightly observed, has really sucked up most of our time and our effort. Um, and the, the, the transition happened gradually. Uh, I would say in the early 2000s, maybe a little bit before that. Uh, Mitch had been, my husband Mitch, who founded the museum with me, he uh, started collecting art uh, in the early 90s. Um, and he became, he, he caught the bug um, and he just kept continuing with, um, with, the, with the collecting. It started with Abex paintings. Um, with artists like Jackson Pollock and Mark Rothko and Clifford Still and Franz Klein. Um, from there, he moved on to Johns and Rauschenberg and other big sort of uh, names that we, that are, are household names. Um, and when I came into the picture, I have a background in contemporary art and I really pushed him in, uh, in a more contemporary direction. Um, so, from paintings, we started looking more at photography. I even finally got him to um, love video, which took many, many years of convincing and exposure. Um, and during that time, we were formulating our thoughts about how we wanted to give back, and what sort of legacy we wanted to leave. Um, and uh, so, I would say once we decided that we were going to build a second museum, that was when the DNA of the place fell, uh, kind of um, emerged. Uh, we started thinking about, well, what, what do we need to do to, to make a difference? And in, um, in Washington, all the museums are free. Um, and so we thought, well, there's no way we could charge admission at Glenstone. It's not, it's not part of the, the culture <laughs> in DC. So, um, and, and also what a gift to give people. You guys have free admission here too, which is fantastic. I feel like that is so important. The barriers to entry are already so high to certain people who don't feel welcome at museums. Admission shouldn't be one of them. Um, so, so we started putting together our, our thoughts about um, uh, how we'd want this place to be and and be beyond our lifetimes. We have a very, very um, kind of detailed and comprehensive uh, blueprint of how we want Glenstone to be run, how it should operate, um, what it will be 100 years from now. So has that vision for the museum changed or will it be changing? I mean, I'm thinking of um, other private museums that might have a particular focus, uh, Crystal Bridges on American art, yeah. Pier 24 on photography. Um, it, what is the vision for the future? It seems for the moment, I mean, that was a sort of wonderful encyclopedic collection. Is that the, you know, where do you see Glenstone um, in the museum landscape sort of now and, and moving forward? Sure, so um, I touched briefly on this. Um, the collection really starts with uh, World War II, and we envision the collection to encompass, at, you know, once all the collecting is done, about 150 years of art. Um, 
the way we came up with that number is that from World War II on, uh, we will collect until the end of our lifetimes, and then our successors, we um, would like them to continue to collect the artists that we collected in our lifetime. So if you do the math, it's about 150. It depends on you know, how healthy we are. Um, so um, the, the whole idea of, of making it a limited uh, interval of time is that we don't feel that a museum, uh, that our museum should need to um, keep pace with collecting contemporary art after we're gone, because it, it's a very, it's an unknown entity. Um, we kind of modeled ourselves on the, um, the Frick, and th that is a stretch goal, but um, you know, our ambition is to become the Frick of the 20th and 21st centuries. I grew up in the Frick, it's a beautiful place. Um, a lot of the work that you showed um, is fairly political, obviously. I mean, from Jasper Johns to Faith Ringgold and uh, Carrie James Marshall, obviously. It, and yet you have this sort of wonderful, serene approach to the holistic experience. And I'm wondering if you've had any, um, it, or what have the challenges been in sort of inserting those, you know, convul convulsions of discontent from modern and contemporary art, which is really the, one of the driving engines of, con of art yeah. uh, into such a you know, beautifully w thoughtful uh, environment. Yeah, um, so we collect art, so, so back to the collecting criteria, we collect, we're hoping that it'll be 150 years of art, and, and so in a way this is a, a, a question about how do we acquire artworks, how do we choose what to show, what to buy, what to collect. Um, so, so our collecting criteria are, are very simple and few. Um, first of all, it has to change the way we think about art. So it really, we, we're really looking at the disruptors of art history and the paradigm shifts that happen, the big ones. And a lot of times, those are the, the convulsions that you talk about. Those are the, the um, the political statements, the, the radical gestures. Um, so they may not be beautiful works of art per se, um, but, but that's kind of what draws us to it because I, I really do sincerely believe that art is more powerful when it can speak to other, um, other things in life, whether it's upheaval, war, you know, conflict, um, racism, things like that. And th that environment that you spoke about, um, you know, there's, there's a moment in, say, the last 30 years where that idea of the museum as a sanctuary or a temple has come under a lot of pressure. And, um, you know, you have other contemporary spaces, like I think of Mass Mocha or Dia Beacon that are in these, you know, industrial buildings. C could you speak a little bit about the choices of Guathme and, and Pfeiffer, and um, just it, at the time it was almost going against trend, and so I'm just curious why that, um, that kind of experience is so important uh, to you. Well, it goes back to this idea of being primed for the aesthetic experience. Um, so we, when we were looking for an architect uh, the second time, um, we, had very particular criteria. And we, so we wanted an architect who understood that making an art museum doesn't mean making a sculpture on top of a hill. Like, you know, I, I'm very particular when it comes to architecture. There's lots of great architecture out there, but a lot of them should not be art museums because they frankly compete with the art that it's supposed to contain. So we, we were looking for an architect whose style and approach would be um, in service to the art that it housed without being a pushover, you know, still, still having a very strong character. Um, and that led us to Tom Pfeiffer. Uh, he's a contemporary modernist. Um, working in that tradition of Guathme, of you know Meyer, of people like that, of 
Um, Peter Zumthor is one of his heroes. And so I think a certain respect for powerful art will inevitably lead you to those architectural voices that tend to be um, less daring, perhaps, um, and more conducive to creating a, a sort of overall environment um, that lends itself to those kinds of um, contemplative experiences. And we'll open it up to questions and just, I just have one sort of final question about um, the geography and was there any apprehension about the geography? I know you very admirably um, have free admission for all Montgomery County uh, public school students. Um, actually, we have free admission to everyone, um, but we we uh, have a program where we bus children in from the Montgomery County public school system. Sorry, right, yeah. covering the, the cost, yeah, which we is cover incredibly the, admirable. Mm -hmm. um, but was there any apprehension about, I mean, I, I was in grad school when the Barnes Foundation was really struggling with that idea of moving from Marion to downtown Philadelphia on Ben Franklin Parkway. Yeah. And that was a, you know, it was a, a community conversation and there were a lot of stakeholders that were upset or on both sides. Mm -hmm. So just thinking about that choice to um, be not isolated, but you know, I mean, was there a real challenge or an apprehension about that choice of geography? Mm. Um, you know, um, I, I do get this question a lot, like why Montgomery County? Why in the suburbs of Washington? Why didn't you choose a place that was closer to downtown? Or, or don't you think that um, a, an urban setting would be um, more deserving of this collection? And um, you know, we're, we're very devoted to our community. Uh, and, and I think that um, actually being not in the center uh, works to our advantage. Uh, we, we are just close enough to Washington, Washington that the political works that we often show have a particular resonance with what's happening on Capitol Hill. Yet we're far enough that we still have freedom um, and control over our destiny. So that it's a nice kind of middle ground. Um, and uh, I also think that if we were in an urban setting, LA, New York, Chicago, Philadelphia, um, London, there's so much cultural activity happening there that it would be very difficult to uh, make an impact or you know, say something new. Um, the other thing is uh, what Montgomery County does for us is we have this incredible piece of land and as I explained earlier, that landscape and nature experience is integral to who we are. We would not have that chance to do that in downtown Washington. <laughs> so, so that, you know, um, you know, frankly, we never even considered going anywhere else. I, I love that phrase that you used, a license to dream, and I just think that you've sort of manifested that in a, in a wonderful museum, so thank you. Uh, any questions for Emily? Emily, it is such an honor to have you here. Um, I have read about Glenstone and just seeing you present it um, just confirms everything I've thought. Um, I'm wondering if there are other museums or campuses that were specifically inspirational to you yes. with the look and feel that you've created. Absolutely, there, um, is, there are about three or four. The first one is the Louisiana Museum of Art um, outside of Copenhagen um, because they also um, fuse art, architecture, and landscape. There's, in my mind's eye, I can see that incredible gallery with the very tall windows where they often show um, Giacometti sculptures. And so there's a view onto this beautiful landscape beyond and man striding, you know, right in front. Um, but you know, <laughs> can you see that? Also, it's like it's it's embedded in my memory. 
Um, and then there's those little walkways where uh, you go from one building to the other. Um, and you're constantly reminded of, of this kind of sense of place. Um, and people just linger there. People love it there. Uh, they, they, they picnic, they take, bring their children. It's, it's, a, it's a very beloved place. And I remember Mitch and I going there and saying, wow, this is what we want for Glenstone. We want people to really feel like they belong at Glenstone. Uh, and, and so it gives me a lot of pleasure to see couples holding hands or um, kids sitting on the floor for long periods of time. Um, so Louisiana, number one. Um, number two, uh, the Manil in Houston is has always been uh, top of mind because of the campus-like format of the foundation um, with the Rothko Chapel and the Twombly Pavilion and then the main building. Um, but this idea that you go from building to building and you make sort of a pilgrimage um, to these different spaces and then you enter and there's a kind of a complete artist vision for you to explore. That was very important to us. Um, we're big fans of Renzo Piano, so <laughs> the, the Violer Foundation in, um, in Basel is also one that we think about quite often. Um, and last but not least, um, Dia Beacon is, is a source of inspiration for us. We have two works by Michael Heiser, um, and I attribute that largely to my experience of seeing um, that extraordinary Heiser work um, at Dia Beacon many years ago. Um, when I read about the lecture you're going to give and read a little bit about Gladstone, um, I immediately thought of an old tradition of the Japanese garden that includes architecture, kind of art within the way it's put together, and the sort of meditative or contemplative aspect of that environment that it's engendering in you or is offered to you. And I just thought of that, and I'm sort of involved with the sort of Eastern traditions in different ways. And mm -hmm. um, it seems that Gladstone is very much similar to that, that, that garden in the center. Yeah really made me think of that and that whole idea of you know when I was young I used to go to the D Young with my folks in San Francisco and so you'd park away from it and you'd walk through the thing and I remember going to when I was young to a and it's something in the Japanese garden there and in the pavilion there was one hanging scroll mm. that was one artwork and that I've always remembered that you know there was like this special experience within this environment that was made to engender this sort of contemplation. And I yeah. just I just really, I mean, now seeing it, I mean, I, I hope we can go there soon. <laughs> Please <laughs> do. I wonder if you could talk Absolutely. about, is that in a, a part of the tradition you? Completely, consider? completely. I, I should have brought um, one of our field guides. So, so uh, w one thing I didn't talk about is scholarship and our publications that we created. Um, a number of publications to help inaugurate the new museum. Um, these are like, you know, beautiful art books, but we we knew that um, they weren't so accessible to say, you know, college kids who are coming and wanted to know about Glenstone. So we created also this little what we call a field guide. A field guide is a nod to, you know, those naturalist guides uh, that talk about birds or trees or whatever. And because we're about art, architecture, and landscape, we have sections, a section for art, a section for architecture, a section for landscape, where we have drawings of the animals and the wildlife and the different trees and how to identify um, certain trees by their leaves and things like that. Long story, um, but uh, one of the terms that we I, um, define there is framed views. And that's a very, very um, traditional Japanese idea, I mean, originally Chinese, but it's um, borrowed views, this, this idea that you create spaces with views of Mount Fuji, <laughs> you know, um, and, and that sort of determines your orientation. 
um, inside a building or inside a, a garden. Um, we, we thought about that constantly. We we're always talking about Japanese um, gardens. Uh, and in particular, um, the Ryoanji uh, dry rock garden in Kyoto um, is, um, is very much, um, was very much an inspiration for this uh, kind of cluster of buildings where you can never see every building from one uh, point of view. You have to walk around it in order to understand and comprehend its totality. Just like at Ryoanji where you can't see all 15 rocks at, at any given point uh, along the platform. So it's, it's, uh, it's meant to be um, a meditative place. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm really happy that you picked up on that. Um, okay, I have one. <laughs> um, thank you for coming and telling us about your museum. I wondered if you'd had a chance to see the Powers Art Museum. I haven't. Where okay. is that? It's down the road about 25 miles. I just got here a few hours ago. It's probably <laughs> the largest collection of Jasper John's works. Really? Uh -huh. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I'll have to come back. The hours are kind of strange, but if you get a chance, it's really... And the building is quite interesting as well, the architecture. Yeah. Two-part question. Who is responsible, first part, who is responsible for acquisitions? Me. <laughs> Over time, are you concerned about creating a collection that might be very limited in scope and narrow-minded? You don't appear to be that sort of person, but I, <laughs> but it the, 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 seems to be the scope of the mission of the art museum is very broad, and I was wondering, yeah. since it is you and you don't have a board. Right. Not yet. Um, so so th this is talking a little bit about governance and the future and how we imagine the collection to evolve over time. And, and we're, we're kind of in the midst of thinking this through. We will have a board. Um, Right now, it's too much fun, and we just want to do it all ourselves. But in the next sort of five to 10 years, we're going to be putting together kind of the roadmap for the distant future. My husband and I are, are really responsible for acquisition, but whereas he has what he calls a day job, um, this is my full-time um, effort. So I'm, I'm thinking about the artists that I would like to be represented in the collection, the movements that we haven't yet covered. Um, so so that, that really does occupy a lot of my time. Thank you all for spending a little bit of your Wednesday evening with us. Thursday evening? Thursday evening with us. That's my week so far. Um, and Emily, thank you so much for your thank generosity you. and uh, for your time. Thank you for coming. Thanks.